Last time uh, we took a look at uh, the introduction of a new food group into the human diet when Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, where God told them that now you're going to need to start eating these green leaves, these herbs, like we originally gave for the cattle and the other animals. Now you're going to need to start eating those. And we noticed some very real reasons why. And we looked at magnesium and the role of magnesium depletion in the body and the devastating effects that has on many, many aspects of physiology. And we realized the love and the wisdom of God just in the role of magnesium related to magnesium depletion due to stress, to anxiety, to fear, to guilt, to sin. Uh, these emotions, these mental changes, these psychological changes, this response of the brain to sin now being part of human existence is magnesium depleting. And from the very first day, God said, eat the greens. But of course, there's lots of things in greens besides uh, magnesium. And we're going to take a look at some further things along that line tonight. But uh, before we go farther into some of the uh, things found in the greens, you know, greens don't taste as good as mangoes, right? Yeah, there, there is something about them that's not quite as appetizing or as tasty as the mangoes and bananas. As a matter of fact, one of the advantages of the green smoothie is we take about this much fruit in the blender to make uh, the rest of those greens uh, palatable. And there is an aspect in which uh, they are not that tasty or that good. They weren't part of our original plan. Our taste buds aren't really adapted to them in that sense. And uh, God makes use of that to explain some important things to us in the scriptures. And probably the best story to take a look at that is at the time of the exodus from Egypt. As they were preparing to leave, God, um, as a special object lesson to them to be perpetuated throughout their uh, generations on an annual basis, besides the Passover lamb, which was slain and the blood put on the doorpost here, um, there was something else they had there. They had the unleavened bread, and they had it with bitter herbs. Why did God bring the bitter herbs in here? You know, if you think about that, there is a... Uh, why did he choose to make that part of this experience, which would be immortalized and repeated over and over every year to remind them of something here? There was a significance to the bitter herbs here. Ellen White makes a nice uh, description here. She says, the Passover lamb was to be eaten with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. This was to keep in their minds the cruel bondage they had suffered in consequence of their sins and forgetting God and breaking his commandments. Eating the bitter herbs was to remind them that they would reap the fruit of their doings, however unwelcome it might be to them. The eating of the bitter herbs was also for the purpose of raising an inquiry in the minds of their children as to the reason for doing this. And the, then the parents could relate to them their sufferings in Egypt and the wonderful power of God in their deliverance. And next time you make a dandelion smoothie and it's a little on the bitter side, remember, God has a lesson in there for you. And it's uh, part of the medicine we take in this world. It was given to us because he loved us. Same reason he gave the Passover lamb, because he loved us. The same reason he gave himself. Everything that God has done for us and to us is for our sake, for our benefit, including uh, the bitter herbs here. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, they can impart a strength, the power of endurance, a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by the more complex, rich diet. Uh, as you went through uh, supper tonight, how many of you saw the big bowl of greens at the beginning of the line? 
How many of you took a big scoop and put that on your plate along with the rest of the foods? Okay, well, hopefully, hopefully then we're getting somewhere with this talk, uh, making some inroads here. To, you're adding those uh, dark greens to your uh, meal plan there. Um, there was an interesting study they did in a group of athletes. These are not sick people suffering from diseases. These were top athletes that did... Uh, not marathons, but these were the ultra runners. They were the, you know, they do 50 and 100 mile type uh, races, the, the real ultimate uh, runners. And uh, they were also did it on a group of CrossFitters that, again, do these multiple different types of exercise. And they took this group of athletes that was already extremely healthy on the top edge of their game, you know, with the best, you know, health program they would come up with because they were competing and they did everything to keep their bodies in the best shape. And the only thing they changed was that they would give them a quart of green smoothie to drink every morning. And that was the same type we've been talking about here, half fruit, half dark greens, and blended up and made into a green smoothie. And they'd have a quart a day, and they did it for six weeks. And they were all amazed at the change that it made in them. Now, we're not talking about somebody that's sick and we're reversing disease here. We're talking somebody that's already in peak physical condition. And they noticed a huge difference in their abilities. Increased energy, you know, the amount like they're running and they've got this increased endurance where normally they would start to feel a certain lag and a burnout at a certain point. Now it's like they're just floating on air and kept going. They really could notice the difference that and their energy level, their endurance. But one of the most impressive was in the recovery times. You know, after you run one of those marathon or marathon plus races, what, are, what happens to you after you've put your body to that extensive endurance? I mean, for the next week and a half, you are recovering because you have really pushed yourself over the limits. And they were finding what recovery times that would normally take them at least a week or more to come back from, in two or three days, they were fully recovered, the soreness was gone, their energy back, they were ready to go again and run another race. A huge difference in the energy, the recovery time, the endurance that these greens bring. And so... uh, I recommend them to you, not just to recover from disease or to keep from some disease, but uh, for your peak performance in everything in life, uh, there is something in these greens that God has put there that we need that make a huge difference for them. Uh, The decreased inflammation mentioned there, they did measure like CRP levels and stuff like that and found out that they were actually doing uh, much, much better. better on those levels on that study as well. Okay, we're going to take a little more in-depth look at vitamin K. Hendrik Dam, a a scientist uh, from Denmark, around 1929, was the first one to discover vitamin K. Uh, He was researching the effect of various diets. Actually, he was checking a cholesterol diet on chickens, and they were studying the various effects of depriving them of certain things and adding certain things back and stuff. And they noticed that the chickens developed on this one particular protocol, this deficiency where they all became, uh, had a bleeding disorder. And they would start bleeding in their intestines or brain and things, and they would die of this bleeding disorder. And they had to add this certain substance back into their diet to stop the bleeding or to prevent the bleeding. And so his initial paper, it was actually published in German. It was called, you see it here with the uh, German spelling, coagulations vitamin. That's what he called it, the coagulation vitamin. There was some vitamin you needed for proper blood coagulation. And because of that spelling and that K, it got the name vitamin K. And so if you wondered where the K comes from, it's the coagulation vitamin. uh, Back a a number of years later, he actually received the Nobel Prize for... uh, his discovery and his work on um, vitamin K. Now, we talked a little bit this morning about chlorophyll in leaves. And I'd like you to take a look at this picture. It's really complex, and it's not here because it's complex, but partly just to appreciate 
God's architect and workmanship in this right here. You know, we talked about inside the cells of the leaf, there's these little chloroplasts. And inside the chloroplasts, these little thalacid membranes, these little, like, little disc-like packets. And organized on the membranes of these little disc-like packets is the mechanism of photosynthesis. And here, in a somewhat diagrammatic way, is a look at all these different proteins, how they stick together, and some of the basic substances in these proteins, how they interact with each other uh, to carry on the process of photosynthesis. Here you'll see chlorophyll A, and you'll notice the very next in line to there is vitamin K1. That's the vitamin K we're talking about there. And so you see, as ubiquitous as chlorophyll is throughout this leaf, what else are we going to find? Vitamin K. So why is there going to be lots of vitamin K in leaves? Because it's an essential part of the electron pathway of photosynthesis. And it's actually its job, you remember chlorophyll absorbs that energy photon from the sun, creates a high energy electron, which the chlorophyll then passes on to the vitamin K. And it gets on passed through this chain. And of course, as long as sunlight is hitting, more photons are being absorbed and more electrons are sent through. And it continues to build up this electric current, this voltage difference across this membrane here. This is actually a picture of the membrane here, sorry, diagrammatically. And that is what creates the energy process of photosynthesis. And here on the end, we have ATP synthetase. And what's it's doing? It's actually creating ATP, the molecule of energy, with the high energy chemical phosphate bond added on the here. This is what is used to build glucose, to build amino acids, and you know, it's used for all the energy functions of the cell. It uses ATP. And so here we are generating this ATP. By the way, it's a phosphate handling enzyme, so what does it need in it? Magnesium, yeah, we need some magnesium here as well as in the chlorophyll. And again, we find the leaves are full of magnesium for many reasons. And of course, our bodies need to be full of them. But our point here is to look at the vitamin K, the one that passes this on right here, as being extensively present. You remember a slide I showed you in the first lecture that was showing how much more of different nutrients were in the greens of a beet rather than the root of the beet? And the very last one on the list was vitamin K, 200,000% more. Well, and that's the reason, because we're using it for photosynthesis there. That's why the leaves need all this vitamin K. Of course, we need the vitamin K, and so we need to be eating these leaves here. In the human body, however, vitamin K has a totally different function. It's amazing how God can take something and he can have, use it for one thing here. Now he can take it over here. It's got a dual function. Use it for totally different reasons and methodologies over here. And in the humans, it's not used to pass along high-energy electrons. It has a totally different function. And I'd like to take a look at some of those of why vitamin K is so important to uh, the human being. This picture right here up in this corner is a picture of a blood clot. You'll actually see red blood cells here, and they're all tangled up and bound together in this spider webby net of fibrin that is formed around there. There's a very complex pathway of proteins that is responsible for creating a blood clot. And uh, vitamin K is essential in that. That's what was happening to the chickens. We, we removed vitamin K and they couldn't make blood clots and pretty soon they started bleeding out everywhere. The ability of our blood to form a blood clot is a very important life-saving function. We can't afford to lose our blood. That's our life force, our life thing. We need blood it's continually circulating through our bodies. We need a heart to pump it. We need lungs to oxygenate it, but we need that blood in the vessels through there. Uh, you know, in my role of emergency medicine, you know, in acute trauma situations and stuff, the role of preventing, stopping bleeding, and uh, restoring blood volume is really critical in saving uh, a patient's life here. Well, God designed this clotting mechanism here, and it's actually very complex. We won't take a look at all the proteins, but there's like 10 or 12 different proteins here, and this one does this to this, and this one does this to this, and this one does, and there's a couple of different pathways there. But the end result of these is that God has a complex mechanism, not only of building the clot, but he's got a lot of controls along the way. Because it's a complex pathway, it can be stopped or started at many different points so that 
we don't clot when we shouldn't. A blood clot in a body where we don't want it can be as devastating as bleeding out from not making a clot when we need it. Uh, today, the formation of DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, has become a really serious issue. And it's one of the things we're quite concerned about. To form a blood clot in a vein where there's not supposed to be one can be very serious. The blood clot breaks loose in the leg, goes up to the lungs. We have a pulmonary embolus, block off the blood flow through the lungs. And uh, if it was a large one, it's all over. It's not going to be able to get in there fast enough to undo that to save your life. If it's a smaller one, uh, we can survive and get by and do some various things to try to pre Prevented from happening again. But um, the ability of the blood to clot and to not clot and to be able to control it is very important. So God has this complex pathway. Calcium is needed in that pathway. And uh, vitamin K is really important at controlling the uh, pathway. And it has to do with this. There are certain proteins, and we find this in almost every protein that needs to handle calcium. There are certain amino acids that come together, creating the electrical area there that holds the calcium. But they have to be changed. It's called carboxylation, for those of you that are in chemistry. But we're basically changing the several amino acids to a different amino acid chemical structure there so that they now are the perfect setting for holding on and managing and handling calcium. And vitamin K is the tool that does it. You think of a machine right here. You have certain size wrenches and certain tools to do certain things to make adjustments or whatever. These machines, we have to adjust something here so they can handle and process calcium. And vitamin K is the only tool that can change that. We've got to have vitamin K. Every time we make a new one of these enzymes, we've got to take vitamin K, turn those little things, turn it around, and change these, it's carboxylating these uh, glutamate uh, residues here, so that they now have the right environment to hold on calcium. And we find this in almost every single enzyme that handles calcium in the active zone, God has designed it. He's found out the best way to do it is with these carboxylated glutamate residues that make just the right environment there. And vitamin K is this tool for doing that with. So vitamin K is very essential here. And of course, in uh, the uh, initial experiments where they discovered it, when they deprived vitamin K, these chickens could no longer properly clot when they needed to, and the bleeding disorder uh, occurred there. Now, there is another aspect of uh, vitamin K metabolism here that's interesting to note. And that is that the body can recycle vitamin K. In other words, vitamin K, when it goes up to carboxylate one of these glutamates, it comes in what they call a reduced form. But in the process of carboxylating that, it itself gets oxidized. And rather being just destroyed and wasted, in other words, a disposable tool, you use it once and you throw it away. God made a couple of enzymes whose job is to reduce this oxidized vitamin K back to its reduced form so he can use it again. And so there's two enzymes whose whole job is just to take vitamin K that's been used up and turn it back into active vitamin K so it can be used again. A really nice little recycling uh, system there so we can keep using the vitamin K. Now, in medicine today, if you get a DVT, one of the things that people are commonly put on in medicine is called warfarin. How many are familiar with warfarin, or it also goes by the name of Coumadin? We often use, call it a blood thinner. Its job is to keep blood from clotting. Well, the way warfarin or Coumadin works is it goes to this recycling system, and it blocks it up. It jams it up. And so every time you use a vitamin K to try to activate one of these, it's used up, it's done, finished, it has to be discarded. It can't be recycled and used over again. And when you stop this recycling cycle, the body is very quickly depleted of adequate uh, vitamin K to do its job, and so the blood becomes thinner. It doesn't clot. So we've stopped this clotting mechanism. 
And of course, the doctors are always trying to get just the right level because we want it to stop clotting enough that you're not, you know, forming more DVTs, but we don't want it to go too far so that you're bleeding out in your brain or in your stomach or somewhere else. And so we're always in that try to balance there, trying to lock it down to here, but not too far. They keep checking the INR regularly, adjusting the dose. And of course, it's sometimes difficult to adjust the dose because everybody's diet changes. And what's in the diet? Varying amounts of vitamin K. So we're continually working on that. Um, but that is one of the places you can see the balance that is going on here with that. Of course, to get everything right, getting the good levels of vitamin K in the body, we're back to the green leaves. Remember, they're 200,000% uh, more vitamin K there. So there's plenty of vitamin K out there in those leaves, but we need to bring them in and to utilize them in the body on a regular basis here to have all of this working properly. Here's a picture. Anybody recognize that picture? That's bone. Yeah, I heard somebody say that's a bone. That's a cross-section of bone under a microscope. Bone is not the dead hard thing you see on Halloween. Bone is a living live tissue. It's full of cells that maintain it. Uh, there's a protein matrix network in here. And it, uh, the cells in here that make up this protein, they actually secrete the right, this protein network. And then the uh, calcium and magnesium and the very thing crystallize and form the hard substance around there. It kind of looks like a cross section of a tree and little rings like that. There's little canals through here. Blood passes through those. And this living tissue, like every other tissue in the human body, is constantly being changed. You know how your skin, you're constantly growing new skin? About every 30 days, you've completely rubbed off all the old skin and grown a completely new layer of skin. Your stomach lining replaces about every eight days. Your bones, about every two, three, four years. You've actually completely replaced your bones. So how does it do that? Well, there's little cells called osteoclasts and osteoblasts. The osteoclasts, are continually dissolving and eating away old bone structure, and osteoblasts are laying down and building new bone structure in there. Of course, these have to be in balance or we're going to have problems. Well, now, these cells have special enzymes that handle the calcium that we're laying down or picking up in there. But without adequate vitamin K, those enzymes that do the job can't be carboxylated, they don't have an active zone that works, and they don't work. And so now we've got osteoclasts and osteoblasts, but they can't do their job. They can't lay down bone like they're supposed to. They can't do that. And we're realizing that vitamin K is extremely essential in the disease osteoporosis. And you can get all the calcium and vitamin D, but if you don't have vitamin K, you're not going to be able to lay down the bone properly. So once again, got to eat the greens if you want good bones. They've got calcium in them, they've got magnesium in them, but they've got the vitamin K. Without the vitamin K, we can't adjust these enzymes so they've got the right active zone to handle the calcium. It's amazing how God figured this all out, balanced and put it together. And he found out substance he could use in both places. In the plant, he uses it to pass electrons back and forth to get the uh, energy in. Here in the human body, he's using it coming down to carboxylate, glucamate residues, and enzymes so they can handle calcium. Amazing thing there. This picture down here is a picture of an artery. A normal artery right here. And here we see progressive... Uh, arteriosclerotic damage. See the plaque building up here, the cholesterol in the artery wall? Here it's built up really thick. We've got this big cholesterol plaque that's become calcified here. Now this buildup of arteriosclerosis is a, again a dietary lifestyle related issue and it's related to the amount of fat in the diet, the amount of cholesterol in the diet, it's uh, related to the amount of sugar in the diet, uh, there's a number, it's a multifactorial disease, like many of these lifestyle diseases, that builds up these cholesterol plaques in the artery walls. Uh, some of you came by and had an IMT ultrasound done right here, and if some of you still want one done, we'll do some more uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning. 
but we can actually take a look and see how much of this layer is built up in your carotid artery, which is pretty indicative of what's through the rest of your body. Some of you found when we looked at it that you not only had a little thickening here, but there was actually a little calcified plaque. On the ultrasound, it shows up as a bright white slot with a black shadow behind it because as the ultrasound sound waves hit it, hit that calcium plaque there, they bounce off and you get a bright white uh, reflection from there and then behind there is a shadow so we can see there's that calcified plaque there. Uh, of significance, when these plaques get calcified, they become much more dangerous. Now the thickened plaque of course is bad and it can cause problems there, but when it becomes calcified, this calcified surface underneath the endothelium here is much more damaging to the endothelium that's stretched over the surface of it. And the likelihood of this endothelial layer here on top of the calcified plaque to rupture or crack and break open becomes increased. Now this endothelium here, remember a couple of years ago we spent a uh, whole lecture talking about the glycocalyx and the endothelium. Any of you were here a couple of years ago? We talked about that. The importance of this lining of the arteries to your health. But here we have uh, got here for this cloud, if it forms cracks, those cracks can be recognized by the, your blood's clotting system. Platelets become sticky and start attaching to it and we start forming a blood clot and we can very rapidly form a clot here. Now if we've got a narrowed artery and we put a clot in there, what happened to the blood flow? Right. So these often are, you might say, the high risk factors that are making us very susceptible to getting a um, attack here, a heart attack. Because if that clots off there and this happened to be one of your coronary arteries, you just had a heart attack. What if this was one of the uh, cerebral arteries in your brain? Well, then you just had a stroke right there. So the formation of these calcified plaques right here is a really dangerous thing to have there. Uh, a few of you that came and looked at your arteries, we found a couple of spots there that... Um, why do these plaques become calcified? Well, it seems that God knew that we weren't supposed to be calcifying things that weren't meant to be calcified. And God actually designed some special enzymes whose job is to pick up calcium in the tissues and get rid of it. It sticks it up in the macrophages and takes out and gets rid of it. And these enzymes are constantly at work cleaning up calcium where we don't need it so we don't end up calcifying all of our tissue. Because we need a lot of calcium in our body, right? We're eating all our greens, getting good levels of calcium in there good levels of vitamin D, we're doing all this stuff, but we want the calcium to be forming in bones, we want the calcium to be available for muscle and nerve reactions, but we don't want calcium just crystallizing out and calcifying tissues in the body. And so God designed these enzymes whose job is to pick up all of this calcium and get rid of it for us so that we don't calcify where we're not supposed to. Of course, these enzymes, guess what they need? Well, we've got to carboxylate the glutamate residues in the active zone so they can pick up calcium. And what does that take? Well, vitamin K. So we've got to have vitamin K if we're going to activate these enzymes so they can work for us. An unactivated enzyme is totally worthless. You can have the DNA code, you can be making all these things you're supposed to make, but if the vitamin K isn't there to finish the job, they're non-functional, they don't work. And so if we are running vitamin K deficient in our body, if we are depleted because we haven't been eating the greens, what happens to all those enzymes? They're just not working. They're not doing their job. And so what's happening? We're building up calcium in these arteries right here. Um, the good news is that this is a two-way reversible process, not only as we've spoken many times about reversing the cholesterol plaques, but this calcium by taking in adequate vitamin K, we can actually activate those enzymes and they can start cleaning up the calcium here. Now it's not going to happen overnight, this is going to take a few years, but we can start the process going in the right direction, we can activate all those enzymes and they can start cleaning this up and they can prevent further. So they will work, we've just got to activate them and we've got to have the vitamin K and you need to be taking it in on a regular basis to uh, get it to work there. Here's a picture. Um, 
This is the spine. This is a lateral view of the lumbar spine. See the vertebrae here. This B right here is a fairly normal. Now right in front of this spine at this point, this is anterior. Posterior, this is where your spinal cord is going out here. This is the back. The front is out this way. Right here in front and right in front of the spine is the aorta. And normally on an x-ray you shouldn't see the aorta. The x-rays go right through it like they do other soft tissues. Now take a look at this picture here labeled A. Do you see the aorta outlined there? What's happened? Yes, the atherosclerosis laying the artery has become calcified. How much calcium is there? I mean, do you realize there is as much calcium in that artery as there is in the bone? That's why this disease is sometimes called hardening of the arteries. These plaques become calcified, hardened, very disease prone. In the aorta, they're going to uh, predispose us to uh, breakdown of the artery wall, what we call triple A's, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Of course, you can get it up here, thoracic aortic aneurysms up in the chest. And of course, these aneurysms, the bad thing about the aneurysms is they can rupture. And when you rupture an artery the size of the aorta, it is almost always fatal, you know, to... Uh, be able to get emergency care fast enough to save your blood supply fast enough to keep you alive until we can go in to do something to fix that. It is an uh, unusual uh, circumstance to be that lucky to survive one of these. Most of the time, a ruptured AAA or a ruptured thoracic aorta becomes a fatal event here. One other thing we should mention about vitamin K is they're now realizing that it has a role in cancer prevention and preventing and treating cancers, certain ones at least. Uh, when uh, prostate cancer, 60-some um, percent more prostate cancer if you have a low vitamin K level. You know, big, big difference there. Um, there were some uh, myelomas, lymphomas that we have found that are, you know, positively affected by having good vitamin K and certainly at higher risk uh, missing them. One study, they followed patients with primary liver cancer. And in this group, they divided, they put half of them, they started giving them vitamin K on a daily basis to supplement their vitamin K. The others, everything the same, except they didn't get the vitamin K. And a few years out, they were, they were looking for reoccurrences of the uh, liver cancer. And in the group that was getting the, the extra vitamin K supplemented back, was uh, they had 13% reoccurrence. In the group that was not getting the vitamin K, they had had 55% of them had gotten a reoccurrence. So there's some role that vitamin K, and I can't tell you the mechanism or how it's working because we don't know that yet, but uh, vitamin K is playing a role there as well. And much as we talked about magnesium earlier, the role of uh, vitamin K in the body is that most Americans are running significantly depleted of vitamin K. You know, we're just not eating the greens in this country and we're not getting vitamin K. And unless someone's taking vitamin K supplements, they're not getting enough vitamin K and they're running vitamin K depleted. And all these processes we're talking about here are not working adequately. Blood clotting's not working right. The bone formation's not working right. I mean, osteoporosis is almost universal in America. I can put up almost anybody's x-ray, you know, by the time they're 50, and you can sew significant thinnings of the bone. You just, you know, to find somebody with normal bones at an old age is a rare occurrence. I remember one day in the ER, I was quite surprised, yeah, I went to pick up this a few years ago. We still had a paper chart back then. But I went to pick up the chart. And on the top, the demographic information's there. And there was a three-digit age. Now, I don't normally see that. But this was 102 years old. It was a little Japanese lady, and she had fallen down. And so her daughter had brought her to the emergency room. So I examined her, and I ordered x-rays of everywhere. She was hurting from the fall. And when I got back the x-rays and put them up on the view box, yeah, we didn't have digital, we still had film x-rays then, put those up on the view box, and I was shocked. 
Her bones were as dense and solid and hard and white as a teenager. There wasn't a trace of osteoporosis at 102 years old. And so I said to her daughter, who translated for her, her, her mom didn't speak any uh, uh, English, only Japanese, and I said, you've got to tell me what you're feeding her, because look at this. And by the way, she didn't break any bones. She was fine. She, she wasn't hurt at all. Um, but I said, you've got to tell me what you're feeding her. And she says, oh, she won't eat any of our food. Only thing she'll eat is her rice and vegetables. She won't eat any of our food. You see, they had come over here to, to America now, and the family had adopted the American diet, but Grandma still wasn't uh, on the American diet. She was still on her rice and veggies that she had grown up on, and it showed in her bones. You know, the diet that includes these foods provides the good health, whereas you start eliminating those, they don't. And so we get the problem with blood clotting. By the way, an interesting case of vitamin K supplementation you may or may not be aware of is in newborn babies. Uh, there used to be this uh, problem where a certain percentage of newborns would get a bleeding disorder. They would bleed out into the brain with very serious, often fatal, if not fatal, uh, usually permanently brain damaging issues. And they could get bleeding other places, this uh, you know, bleeding disorder of the newborn. And they realized after some time that it was due to a vitamin K deficiency in these newborns. And today, the standard uh, protocol at any hospital in the United States is that every newborn gets a shot of vitamin K. You know, within 24 hours, you know, usually right there after birth, they're doing the initial things, the baby gets a shot of vitamin K. And now we don't have those bleeding problems anymore. But it shows the vital role of this vitamin in keeping the body working right. And certainly uh, mothers that are choosing to breastfeed uh, by the way, which I highly recommend as the ideal food that God designed for babies. Um, eat your greens. Yeah, your baby needs it too. So we need that vitamin K in there to make everything um, work right. How shall we eat the greens? Talked about this briefly. Of course, you saw on the dinner table today the big bowl of dark greens. I Hope you're inspired to include fresh salads on a regular basis every day in your diet now. Don't bypass the salads for the entrees. I'm not saying you don't eat the entrees. I'm just saying include the fresh salads. They're, they were meant to be there. You need them. They've got your vitamin K, your magnesium, and, of course, dozens and dozens of other nutrients that you need there. Of course, we can cook up these uh, greens. Uh, does cooking destroy some of the vitamins? Uh, it does destroy some of them. Um, the, uh, you know, vitamin C and stuff will be a little bit less after uh, cooking, and some of the others will be less. Uh, the uh, magnesium won't be destroyed or touched. It's an elemental thing. You won't phase that. Uh, any of the smaller molecules, it doesn't phase or bother them at all. But cooking the greens is still an excellent uh, way to get the greens into your diet. Uh, um, cooking them up savory with some onion or garlic is often a very tasty way that many people have found to add them in, adding in this case here, they've got some chickpeas here, many of the other legumes mixed in. Uh, I like some of the uh, Mediterranean, Moroccan type spices and seasoning seem to go well with the greens there. But uh, some of your cooking school teachers can give you a lot more ideas and suggestions on how to cook the greens. Uh, you can also add greens to other dishes where they don't become the major, I'm just eating greens, but you're cooking up a pot of beans, yeah, shred up a leaf of kale and mix it in there. It's a little bit all through there. And many other dishes you're cooking up and fixing up, you can add some, uh, you know, little kale or spinach shredded up in there to it. And it really, cooking up va various other steamed vegetables, hey, be sure and throw some parsley in with them. Uh, Shred up some more spinach and mix in there. It's just mixed in there a little bit, but you're getting that extra magnesium, extra vitamin K, trying to boost these levels of things that most of us are deficient in. And we really want to get those back up there so we're optimizing our thing. And, of course, God's gift to the final generation, green smoothies. You know, no other generation in the history of the world has ad had access to these. But... Uh, God knew we need them, and so God invented the Vitamix. And, uh, you know, 
Here's uh, one of my kitchen here. I filled it full of fruit. And anybody recognize those greens? They're carrot tops. Yeah, I got a bunch of organic carrots at Whole Foods, and they come with all the. Top. Hey, I save those greens, put the tops in. I usually take the stems off. There's not too much nutrition in stems, whether we're talking about kale or carrots or beets or many of these things. There's not too much in the stems. But the leaves, all the leaf parts are really is where the uh, nu nutrients are located there. So that's a whole bundle of uh, carrot tops there in this particular one. Um, there's very quick to make. You just throw in your fruit, throw in your greens, either pour in coconut water or pour in just regular water. Or some people add pineapple juice. Uh, adding a banana or a mango is a little bit sweeter if the greens are a little bit not, a little too bitter or not tolerable to you. You know, use some of the sweeter fruits. Be, include a mango and banana in addition to some of the more milder, blander fruits. It'll make them uh, tastier there. And then, of course, just liquefy those and uh, drink them down. And uh, they'll keep um, a day or two in the fridge. You know, so you can make up a couple of quarts, stick them in the fridge, and drink it over a day or two. They're still fine for one or two days there. Um, and then very easy cleanup. I mean... You take this to the sink, turn on the water, rinse all the green out of it, shake it out a second time, and set it there to drain, and you're done. Um, I mean, it is really a fast food. You know, we're on the fast foods today. Green smoothies are a fast food. They, they, they take just minutes to make and clean up and provide tremendous amount of energy and staying power to start your day off with. So God's gift to us in the final generation here. Uh, healing properties. Uh, you know, we haven't mentioned really medicinal properties in the green herbs. Uh, there's whole encyclopedias of herbal remedies, and I'm not going to talk about those because I don't know a lot about them. But uh, there are different ones that have different uh, almost medicinal type properties and that can be used wisely in different ways. And certainly are probably milder and less damaging than the drugs that we doctors prescribe for various ailments. So, uh, be open to the um, thoughts of herbal remedies there in place of some of the harsher, more toxic drugs that we prescribe there as we look at some of the healing things going on there. That's my backyard just last week. I snapped this picture while I was putting these slides together for you to see what was there. Uh, a few months ago, that was bare dirt out there. Um, went out and started planting. You know, greens are easy to grow, and uh, it doesn't take too much work to do it. Let's see. I had something on there. Anyway, they're easy to grow, and you're better off with fresh, homegrown greens than anything you get in your store. One of my motivations to do this, I realized early on last summer I was studying and reading this and realized, wow, I really needed to increase the greens in my diet. And so I started making green smoothies. And one thing you'll notice when you start making green smoothies on a regular basis is you're always going to the store to buy more greens. I mean, you're going through bunches of kale, and you know, the people look at your cart, you've got all of these kales and parsleys and all this stuff piled up in there. And, you know, anyway, um, but I also was noticing, not only was I buying lots of greens, but I was noticing those greens did not look that good. A lot of times they're kind of wilted. They've been there for a few days. Some of them are even starting to turn a little yellow there, you know, along the edges of the kale and stuff. And I thought, man, is this really the best uh, option right here? I looked into it, and I found some interesting stuff right here. Here's a good example here with broccoli. Now, the difference between broccoli in the field and your garden when you pick it and the difference in broccoli that has been a pick commercially put in ideal storage conditions, ideal packaging, shipping conditions. I uh, got into your grocer, and your grocer has put them out there under the little misters for maybe one day or two days. And they've, they've done some research where they've actually checked the various nutrient levels there. And you'd be amazed at how much, how rapidly greens lose their nutrients. Um, glucosinolates. Anybody know what those are? Those are the class of phytochemicals that we realize now are responsible for the cancer beneficial uh, properties in here. 
uh, between broccoli and cabbage and kale have these uh, uh, glucosinolates in them and uh, they can prevent cancers and they can actually reverse many cancers. Uh, many people are now realizing that, hey, you got cancer, let's start juicing cabbage. You know, we want to get lots of this stuff in here. What you buy in the store may have already lost 80% of its glucosinolates. The flavonoids, down 75%. Vitamin C, down 50%. And this is similar across many other categories of greens right here. Once you cut them, things start changing. And uh, so there's certainly advantages to going out and starting your garden in your backyard. And I want to stress how easy it is. I mean, God has advised in these last days of earth's history as we look for the things that are coming upon this earth to get out in the country where we can grow a garden and raise our own food. And as you think along those lines or start moving on along those lines, don't forget the greens. It's the easiest food to grow and it's probably the most nutritious food to grow. It's available year round. You can only pick apples in season, tomatoes a little bit longer season through the summer, depending on how you plant them. The same with most vegetables that fruit. You can only get them in certain seasons, and you've got to work and grow them for a long time. But your greens are there pretty much year-round in most climates, um, certainly here in California. Um, you know, I put mine in a couple of months ago, and now they're just growing way faster than I can juice them. But uh, they're very easy to grow. You can get these little plants from the nursery and put them in. But what you're going to find is greens are really easy to grow from seeds. And maybe you haven't tried it before. Plant some spinach seeds and get started. Get some kale seeds, some broccoli seeds, some various, you know, Swiss chard, some of these seeds. And start planting some of those seeds and see how amazing it is they grow. And, and one of the things that's very impressive is... You don't have to have full sun like you do for many, uh, you know, if you're going to grow tomatoes and eggplants and squash and corn, where do you need to position your garden? Well, out where it gets full sun. You need sunlight to grow all of those fruits and stuff, to make all of the, carry on the photosynthesis, to make all those sugars, to make the fruits what they need to be. But not so the greens. That spot in my backyard right there has a huge oak tree beside it. It gets a few hours of sunlight a day. And they're just growing fantastic out there. And they're just taking off and growing. So you're very adaptable to where you can put them in the yard. But I really encourage you to go home and plant some greens. Get them growing. And, you know, once they start growing, you can start the leaf method of harvesting. Instead of going out and cutting off a whole head or a whole bunch, you go off and pick a couple leaves off of this one, a couple of big leaves off of this one, a couple of big leaves off of this one. Leave the little center leaves that are coming up, and they'll turn into big leaves. And you go back a day later, and you, you go around. You can pick every day without damaging your garden, per se, and it just keeps growing and growing. It'll get ahead of you, I guarantee you. And uh, you'll be looking for friends to give greens to for their green smoothies. So if you don't have a garden, look for a friend that's got one because he's probably got extra greens he doesn't know what to do with. Somebody asked this question this morning about a book about wild edibles. Sergi Batinko is a and part member of a family that is really into greens. They started off being raw veggies, you know, eating raw, just raw foods and got really good results. And then they discovered the greens and found it took them to a whole new level beyond just being on a raw food diet. And they travel around the country and give seminars. They've written books. They've gotten all kinds of DVDs and videos out all about greens and green smoothies. Uh, a lot of the information I read in researching this, I picked up from various materials written by him or his sister or his mom or one of the people in their family there. But he has written this book right here on wild edibles. A really fascinating topic that all of us who are looking to learn to eat greens in the last days of this earth should know about. Uh, there is, besides what you grow so easily in your yard, they're growing easily out there without anybody trying to plant them or cultivate them or grow them. They just grow, and we call them weeds, and we cut them down, and we mow them down, and we spray them, and they still keep growing. And uh, many, many of these weeds out there, wild herbs and stuff, are very edible, extremely highly nutritious. 
you remember in that one list, I listed lamb's quarter there besides the kale, so you could again see the amount of nutrition they are in there. And they're quite tasty. They actually taste quite good. Uh, there's a picture of the lamb's quarter leaves right there, but I highly recommend that book as a good place to start if you want to understand, uh, you know, if you're out in the mountains in the woods, uh, these, you can live off of this kind of stuff. Um, anybody know what that is? It looks like a dandelion, but you see the large triangular tip out here, and uh, if it, when it went to bloom, it sends up a long stalk with multiple dandelion-looking blossoms on. It's called a south thistle. Closely related to dandelions, it's kind of part of that same family. Very edible and um, good for you. Just pick those leaves and throw them in your blender along with whatever else you're blending up that day. Um, these came up in my backyard. I didn't plant them. They just came. Mallow. Now, most of you may not have known what this was, but it's so distinctive in shape. I'm sure if you've grown a garden, you've seen this stuff growing somewhere. If you've got a yard, you've seen these weeds come up somewhere. You recognize those little round leaves? Well, I first learned about those when I was a little kid. You see, my grandmother would go out and pick those leaves. She let them grow. I mean, they would go. You, you, they get some good soil. You know, they're three feet tall. And uh, she would go out and pick those leaves and cook them up as a green, like we would cook up spinach. And she had done that all her life. Her mom had taught her that. She had done it since she was a little girl. Um, it just was part of, uh, hey, that's one of the things you ate. It was free, and it was nutritious. It tasted good, was good for you, and uh, was considered part of the diet. Um, don't be afraid to add mallow to your green smoothies or steam up a pan full. There's your dandelion. And, of course, dandelions come in lots of varieties. There's hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of varieties of dandelions out there. Chickweed. You know what this? These are little teeny leaves. This is a fairly close-up. Little teeny leaves. It gets in a little mat, only, you know, three inches to four inches tall, maybe. But it's just full of these teeny little leaves. I think it got its name because the chickens like it. Gobble it up. But, uh, again, another delicious uh, Wild, edible, that's out there growing for free. Anybody know that one? It's called purslane, a very distinctive one. It's got these uh, tubular, round, uh, reddish-looking stems, and the leaves are really thick, succulent-like leaves. They're not thin like a regular leaf. They're a thick, succulent-like, juicy leaves. Edible, considered to be very high in vitamin C. Many people recommend this as sort of a... Oh, you got a cold? Take some purslane to get over it. Or there's a flu going around? Take a bunch of purslane so you don't get the flu. Um, but just good for everyday herb. Pick it. Add it to your blender when you make your next smoothie there. Yes, most of these weeds do. You know, a lot of times what you're going to find is the flavor is going to depend on the soil and the growing condition. And, it's, you know really good soil in some places. It's be very mild and sweet, and then harder, more difficult soils will become more stringent in various ways. But yeah, I've, I've picked all, everything you see in that picture there, I've tried picking and adding to uh, our smoothies this summer, so we've had some of all of those there. Um, you know, all the grasses are edible. There's no poisonous grasses. Uh, a lot of people raise and grow wheat grass, but Every other wild grass that's growing out there can be eaten. And it's, again, it's tender, you know. I mean, it's not the real old tough hard stuff, but the tender stuff there can be added to things. Um, so we come here to our conclusion, our second round right here. God's advice is to eat the green herb of the field. And hopefully what we've shared with you in these two presentations has added a new food group to your menu on a regular basis. And... You'll come back next year with all kinds of testimonies of the wonderful things that has happened to you in the year in between with the green smoothies and the salads and the wild greens and all the stuff that God's put there for us, the, the bitter herbs, part of our sojourn in this world.